What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Insomnia for Lunch. I'm Anubis. This is Space Guide. And what if I told you someone could show you how to love yourself and love others, all the while laughing with you, laugh at him? That is a genius of Jim Carrey. No matter the critical acclaim of the movie, Jim Carrey has always given us a top tier performance that shows us a new side of himself while also showing us a new side of ourselves. And both of us have movies that exemplify that trait. The first movie I'm going with is, in my opinion, a 90s classic, 90s classic comedic film, a 90s classic comic book film. Yes, this is a comic book film. I'm talking about 1994's The Mask. Yeah, like I said, for those of you who don't know, um, The Mask is based on a comic book. I don't know if, I don't think it was like Marvel or DC. I think it was just something like, just on the side. But yeah, like, and um, also this was a Norse mythology movie before, you know, the Thor movies made like Norse mythology, like popular in comics. Like, you know, this movie is actually about Loki. The Mask is Loki for those of you who don't either remember or don't know. But yeah, like he's supposed to be Loki in the movie. So yeah, like basically the wooden mask turns you into Loki. This movie as well, the other movies that I've chosen are movies that deal with characters who have a hard time like either finding themselves or like loving themselves. Like they feel inadequate about the, either the job they have, like in this case, like Stanley Ipkiss and the, the job, job he has, the life he's living. He just feels like he's just going nowhere, down on a slope, whatever. And the mask more or less shows him like how to be confident and how to better himself. And at the time, I don't think we really realized we really realized that, but yeah, like it does. I just remember thinking that I don't know. I can't. I can't really put it into kids' terms, but I do remember just that being like the first time I saw Jim Carrey in a film, and it was like his transition from television in Living Color. I remember on, on, on the Living Color, especially mm -hmm. Fire Marshal Bill was probably one of my favorite characters to do. Uh, my neck probably has veins in it now from from mimicking it so many times when I was a kid. But uh -huh. the mask was just that step up for him in my mind as like just this guy that I could put on repeat whenever I wanted to. And the character of uh, Stanley Ipkiss was I didn't really see him as lacking confidence. I saw him mostly as the mask because as a kid when he put on the mask, that's when he came alive to me. So um as an adult, I can see how it could help you stay confident and want to be more of Loki. Apparently, I guess that's who he is. Um, yep. More so than Stanley. But I think when you really get into it, it's it's learning that they're one and the same. That Loki is Stanley. Like there's no separation. They're one and the same. It's just it's just being able to realize your true potential or realizing who you really are and that's the only, that's the only difference like even though the mask imbues you with the powers like in the um, energy like the powers of loki it is also like ultimately depending on who wears it it makes you like more of who you really are and so when we see stanley ipkiss as loki become like more confident and funnier definitely funnier and that's like more suave with lace, especially his love interest, you know, Cameron Diaz's character in the film. Like when we see that and then we compare that to how like the villain, the mob guy in the movie, like when he puts on the mask and becomes like more of an asshole, more evil. Like the fact of the matter is Loki, the mask of Loki is just also ultimately making you who you, more of who you really are. It's not necessarily turning you into this own separate thing. It's bringing out your truest self, your highest self for better or worse. And so for that, when we like come to the end and Stanley realizes that he doesn't really need even need the mask at all, it's just like a reminder that, look, it's always been in you. Awesome. You know, just in this particular case, Loki just helped people get it, get get like that extra boost. But like, he's not putting it, he's not putting, Loki wasn't putting anything in Stanley or anybody who put on the mask that wasn't already there. So my number one is... The Cable Guy, released in 1996. This movie is available with the subscription to Amazon Prime Video. This film was directed by the great 
and debla debatably iconic uh, Ben Stiller. It was written by a, I think he was a prosecutor, like a, an attorney, and his name is Lou Holtz. It's also allegedly written by Judd Apatow, which we'll probably get into that another time. Um, mm -hmm. It stars, obviously, Jim Carrey, um, Leslie Mann, and the guy who made it cool to ditch school and do absolutely nothing. And that is uh, Matthew Broderick. And in this film, they, a lot of people consider this a dark comedy. But The Cable Guy, of course, is a cult classic, which means, obviously, either you're obsessed with it or you hate it. And um, that that's perfect for this film because I feel like this film deals with unhealthy obsessions. And just Jim Carrey, a.k.a. Chip, um, just the way he goes about his life serves as a model as to, like, how to not live your life. And it just helps you gauge, like, what's healthy, what's unhealthy. It makes you re-examine that type of stuff in your life. He goes as far as doing unimaginable favors for for um, Stephen, played by uh, Matthew Broderick. He um, tries to fix his relationship. He takes him to medieval times. He buys some prostitutes. He does everything for this guy. But at the end of the day, many people will describe him as the villain in the film. And so you have to figure out why people say that. But I would like to take at a different time to, to examine why Matthew Broderick as Stephen is actually the villain in the film. Um, it's probably the same thing as my Thanos take. But um, yeah, it's about it's again, it's about unhealthy, unhealthy obsessions. Um, and it's just something that I think you should gauge better gauge it, like how you're living them. That this this film is unique because it's almost as if someone from the future went back to 1990, I guess you would say five, um, or maybe 1994, probably when we wrote it. And they told Lou Holtz about the future, about the internet, online dating, um, online shopping. And he just made a film based off of what he was told. He never had to see it, but he just based it off of that. And even um, Chip, AKA, the great and iconic Jim Carrey, he has a line where he says, where he's just mentioning a whole bunch of stuff about the future, like in the future. And he even goes as far as to say, like, um, you won't even have to leave your house to shop and you'll be able to play Mortal Kombat with some guy from Vietnam. And it, and it's like, everything that he says in that part of the film is just so spot on to what like the internet is. And even like the unhealthy obsession that we have with like media, social media, and, and like even just like television, which, in a uh, film, which this channel is based upon, is probably an unhealthy obsession with film. Um, Insomnia for Lunch does not preach addiction, but it does preach just consuming films at a steady pace. So I will change that. We we, we preach a healthy obsession with film. But to some, it yeah. might be unhealthy, just like some people consider it a dark comedy. But yes, The Cable Guy, starring Matthew Broderick, Jim Carrey and Leslie Mann, which some people know as the chick who stole the scene in the 40 year old virgin. Um, she's also in This mm -hmm. Is 40. This film also guest stars great and iconic names such as Jack Black, Owen Wilson, Ben Stiller, and the great, well, I wouldn't say great. David Cross is really not that known. He's probably most known for. Uh, being the I can do it myself guy in scary movie too, ah. uh, but um, but yeah, David Cross is also in this film. It's just really like if if looking back at it, the Cable Guy is a great film for for anybody who is who can acknowledge the fact that they're obsessed with television or social media, and it just gives you an opportunity to take a second, laugh at what you're doing or what others are doing and then make that change. It's obviously stating that these things aren't as healthy for you as the cycle would make you think. You get into this habit of doing these things and it's like, it's funny to laugh at it. Okay, like now let me make this change. And I think that's what the cable guy does. Uh, we'll get more into specifics on the cable guy when we actually do a deep dive on it, but this is just a great film. This is probably one of Jim Carrey's best films. I would say maybe in this top seven, 
You know, scratch that. Fuck it. It's uh, it's all about what I think. It, in my opinion, Cable Guy is in this top five. It's a top five film for Jim Carrey. Cable Guy, nineteen ninety six, the great and iconic Jim Carrey. Couple things for me. Um, great, iconic. That poster. I feel like that poster still holds up with him. That smirk and you know holding the cable like. Like we all remember that poster. Like I, I with even without me having seen the movie, I know exactly what that poster looks like. Exactly. I don't have to go and look at it. We're actually gonna um, do a poll because I disagree with the cable guy. Although it is memorable, I will say that it's not that great. I always consider the great posters being the ones with wide angles. Anything that's close yeah. up, I feel like it's not really telling a story and it's just yeah. featuring it's featuring not necessarily the movie, but the person in the lead position. And so I would disagree. Uh, let us know in the comments or answer to the poll. Is the cable guy an iconic poster? All right. So and then you said Le Leslie Mann is in the movie. So, yeah, Judd Apatow definitely had to have a role in this movie because anywhere she goes, he goes. <laughs> and I'm I'm definitely going to get into that later because it's a, it's a big controversy. Uh, again, like I said, when we do a deep dive, I'll de I definitely want to talk about that because it's, it's something that's it sounds like what Judd Apatow says is true. Uh, but he doesn't get a story credit, and that's just what goes on in history. I actually like the idea that you chose this movie because it helps transition into my next movie. When you talk about unhealthy obsessions, my next movie is 1997's Liar Liar, mm -hmm. and this movie focuses on um, Jim Car Jim Carrey playing a lawyer who's so obsessed with his job that he he falls short of you know maintaining a relationship with his own son and you know it also leads to the failure of his marriage well his marriage failed before the movie even started but still it's just like this sense of like being so obsessed with something even if you're good at it because that's the thing he's really good at his job but he's good at it by being completely dishonest <laughs> and so you know when he's forced um to tell the truth because his son you know makes a birthday wish for him to tell the truth like, you know, hijinks ensue, obviously, and yeah, hilarious things happen, but it ties into the idea of like, you know, living your truth and being true to like how you feel. And sometimes like you just need to like tell people what's really on your mind, because I feel like we struggle as people to uh, with, you know, other people in our lives or maybe like at our jobs or whatever, where we um, we hesitate or we just bottle up our real feelings towards people thinking that, you know, we don't want to rock the boat or thinking that, you know, we don't want to offend somebody or we don't, you know, like we're scared of the outcome if we like speak our truth, but, you know, it ultimately benefits, um, you know, Jim Carrey's character to tell the truth. And the most profound moment, it's not even a humorous one when it comes to him telling the truth, is actually like a very serious one where he admits that he's a bad father. And like, yeah, like, you know, the fact that, you know, you see the look on his face when he says that, and he has to come to terms where it comes, he has to come to terms with the fact that he's failed as a father. And it's something that I know that like a lot of us struggle with, like, especially when it comes to like raising kids, like coming to terms, like uh, coming to terms with, our failures coming to terms with our insecurities about how we're doing as parents. And yeah, I just like the way this movie handles that in such a relatable way, you know, whether you are the parent who is so obsessed with their job and just needs to like slow the fuck down, <laughs> or you are a child who grew up with parents who were like, you know, like, like a father who's never around or a father who's just like, you know, a parent that was so like into the job that they couldn't make time for you. You know, there's a relatability on both sides of the spectrum. And yeah, like, you know, living your truth, finding who you like, you know, you know, yourself and others. I think this movie does that in such a creative, humorous and even emotional fashion. I don't think that Liar Liar says this. I don't remember this being a line. Sometimes you grow up and you and you think that your parents don't love you or or they don't have time for you or whatever. But then the older you get, you start I cut your parents some slack. So I don't remember it's being a line in the movie, but just let that shit go. Bro. Like, yeah. After a while, you got to chalk it up to sometimes people aren't ready to be a parent at a certain amount of time, or you know they have to learn how to be a parent. Like, 
just chalk it up and say maybe maybe their lack of effort or their lack of attention made you more attentive. It made you a better person. If you're able to 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 point out their mistakes, you know that it's wrong. So then you know not to do this shit. So yeah. let that shit go. L I G it, man. Let that shit go. Digital high five to anybody who knows where that's from. L I G it. Let it go. Let it go. Do you know where it's from? Since it's that Keisha Cole. This is a movie. This is a movie channel. Welcome to Insomnia for Lunch, where we talk about movies and only movies on this show. And someone would say Keisha Cole's movie. life is a movie. If you know her backstory, hey. Some would say. <laughs> so I, I do have a question for you. Mm. Is 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 are you going in three, two, one order? Is it any like type of because I know the mask, it's not a better film than Liar Liar. And it's just too corny to be ahead of Liar Liar in general. So are you doing a three, two, one type situation? Honestly, you could just more or less say that I'm going in in order of release. But when you talk about quality, I do want to say like the laughs are kind of like on par. Like I I don't know. I don't think I don't think it's such a landslide. Cause there's some really fun and funny moments in the mask and and then in this movie too. Like, I don't know. Like maybe this movie, well, this movie's probably more quotable for sure. You know, just like I said, the first time he realizes that nah, he has to tell the truth. Nah. I don't know, because not more quotable than the mask, though. Somebody man. Like, come on, bro. I don't know. It's hard because like that like that movie was so movie. iconic that 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 Tamara Maori quoted it on Sister Sister, like several parts of the mask on her mm. show. Nah, bro. I don't think it's more quotable than the mask. I'm not gonna give it that. It's definitely probably a better movie, obviously. Yeah. And it might have the edge on I don't know. Because as comic book e as Jim Carrey was in the mask, he's as animated in Liar Liar in terms of like yeah. not wanting to tell the truth and like and the lengths he would go to avoid telling the truth. So I don't know. That's funnier when he doesn't have makeup. Because like he was just like when he first wakes up next to what is his boss or whatever, he's like, I've had better. Like to me, like that line still stands out to me. Like I've had better his face when he says that too. And then of course, well, granted, this scene probably doesn't hold up today because of the implications of it, but the elevator scene. Um, to me, what he says Since in the when did we, scene, bro, like that. Let's just make this a rule. We <laughs> we only care about what we care about. Like, yeah, yes, we we do believe that everybody should. That now I'm not gonna even uh, validate it. Look, <laughs> it is what it is. Like comedy is is its own is its own box. It's is is it funny or is it not funny? That that's it. I mean, yeah, I still consider it funny. And, like, there are consequences for what he says in the elevator. If you want to call it harassment, he does get slapped for it. So you can say the movie acknowledges that what he did was wrong. So for my second film, I'm going to go with arguably his greatest performance, arguably one of the greatest performances of all time in cinema history. And it is 1999's Man on the Moon. Yes, I said it. Arguably one of the greatest performances in cinema history. Jim Carrey in Man on the Moon. Um, and this was directed by Milos Forman. It was written by Scott Alexander and Larry Karazeski. I think that's how you pronounce it, Larry's last name. Kar Karazeski. Let's just move on. Let's just move on. Obviously, it stars, again, the genius Jim Carrey. Um, it has Danny DeVito. Oh, Courtney Love. And it also has uh, Paul Giamatti in it. Also yeah. an icon in his own right. Um, hit that like button if you are a Paul Giamatti fan. But right now, we're, the spotlight's on Jim Carrey, who I don't know how a, an icon this great or this big, who will put on a performance such as he did in Man on the Moon, could be underrated, but I, I know for a fact Jim Carrey is underrated. This is a surrealist film. This this movie is so surreal on so many levels. Obviously, um, if you never heard of this film, you probably never heard of who Jim Carrey is playing. Jim Carrey plays the comedian Andy Kaufman from the 1970s. This was a very unique person. 
Um, but Jim Carrey essentially becomes Andy Kaufman in the making of this film. And throughout the film, Jim Carrey stays in character. This is this is method acting at its finest. Um, but Andy Kaufman was was a guy who <laughs> essentially, and that's what makes it surrealistic because there's so many levels to it. Jim Carrey is staying in character, making a movie about a guy who constantly stayed in character. Andy Kaufman was Eddie Murphy in the clumps in real life. So he played multiple characters, but he walked around as those characters in everyday life. So you might have seen him in the store. You may have seen him on a talk show playing these other characters. And a lot of people in the 1970s did not know that Andy Kaufman was all of these people who were considered celebrities. So even talk show hosts like Johnny Carson, they would try to get him to admit that he was these different characters, specifically Tony Clifton. That was the one that they wanted the most because everybody loved to hate Tony Clifton. And they just like he couldn't do it, but he was basically like taking on these all these different characters like Eddie Murphy does in his movies, but he was doing this shit in real life. And so like all these prank videos that you see like nowadays on social media, like he was that, but he was committed to those characters. Like a lot of times you watch those and it's like, and you can tell it's fake, like it's scripted. You couldn't tell, and and even watching this film, you couldn't tell if you can't tell if he knew that this was real or if it was fake. And again, this is like one of Jim Carrey's best performances, one of the best performances ever, just in the sense of you don't know what's real and what's fake. And even at the end, you don't know, you cannot figure out what's real and what's fake. And that's this is the most realistic surreal surrealism I've ever seen, whether it's a painting, a movie, whatever it is. Um, this movie is just great. It's just great overall. Watch Man on the Moon, starring Jim Carrey as Andy Kaufman, Tony Clifton, and a long line of other characters. There's even moments, like, and this is how much this movie fucks with your mental, right? There's even moments where I think Jim Carrey's playing other characters in the background. <laughs> and I'll have you looking at the movie that closely. Like, oh, I think that's Jim Carrey too. Like, I, I started tweaking watching this. And that's why I, I will relate this film to like a fun house where it's like, it's all these, these mirrors in there and there's different images. And I think the average person would get lost in that. But I believe what, what Andy Kaufman did was he was so into what he liked and you see that in the film because a lot of times people try to change him and tell him what, what his act should be about, especially when he first started out. He was so sure of himself that he never did anything that he didn't personally think was fun. He was so centered within himself. And I think um, the cable guy is an unhealthy obsession with others. His is a, is it's, you can't say it's healthy or unhealthy. It's just, it's an obsession with self. And I think that's something to take and just say, what I like is what I like, and this is the standard. Anything beneath that, other people can have. But what I like is what I like. And I think to be obsessed with yourself is the key takeaway from this film. The Man on the Moon, or Man on the Moon, starring Jim Carrey, directed by Milos Forman. This is one of them ones. Check out Man on the Moon, starring Jim Carrey. Who directed this movie again? Milos Forman. Okay, because it's just the way you're describing, especially with the whole surrealism aspect. I kept thinking Darren Aronofsky. I was just like, man, it sounds like we'll be right up his alley. It has a hint of that. It's not as obviously it's not as dark as because that's a that's a guy who directed uh, Black Swan, right? Black Swan, Requiem yeah. for a Dream, yeah. Yeah, it has a hint of that, but it's not as dark as those films. It's 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 light, and I don't know. I, some people might say it's dark just because mm -hmm. of how he went about making his jokes believable. Some people might say it's dark. I also don't think the cable guy's dark, so I'm probably not the best barometer for it. <laughs> and I like definitely adding this to the list. Um, yeah, surrealism, love surrealism. Um, Jim Carrey doing surrealism, like, why haven't I seen this yet? Yeah, uh, like I said, adding, adding it to the list for sure. I don't know if other people would characterize it as surrealism, but 
I am a person who watched Man on the Moon, so I could give less than a fuck about what other people consider it. I consider it surrealism. And I'll probably explain more of that as to why in the next film. But yeah, you want to talk about dark humor. Like, yeah, this movie, uh, my final choice is definitely like <laughs> dark humor for sure. It cracks me up, still cracks me up. I watched it recently. It's still funny to me. But yeah, like I definitely see how the humor in this movie is dark. Uh, 2000s, me, myself, and Irene, um, you know, Jim Carrey, uh, Renee Zellweger, you know, Anthony Anderson's in here. Um, oh, man, like, I, I'm not gonna lie, I miss humor like this. You want to talk about dark humor, like, I miss this type of humor, like, this no fucks given, <laughs> like, such a ridiculous concept that they go all the way with. Um, but yeah, like, the major through line with this movie, like, when it comes to, um, like, self-love and then ultimately, like, you know, loving others, but for stars, like, loving others, his character is pretty much the epitome of that because again, like dark humor and all, but he he loves his kids without no hesitation. The fact that they are not his kids, you know, he has three black kids by a woman who cheated on him with a black man, but he ends up raising those kids like his own, and you know, like has showing that. <laughs> unconditional love yes it's played for laughs like you're laughing right now it's definitely a funny scenario but the fact that he's just like so willing to love them and so willing to like give to them it's just like man like you know it's like it's kind of touching honestly and you know like you know watching like you know black comedians with him to me that was dope you know and you know that was a great scene right there that was i mean but that's how he started his career yeah exactly i feel like it was a light homage to that even if it maybe it was coincidental, but I feel like it was kind of like a little like like tip of the hat to where he started, you know. So, you know, like so he's always having a appreciation for like, you know, black comedians and stuff like that. I love that. So that and then um just like the scenarios he finds himself in, like the abuse that he goes through, like, you know, whether it's getting kicked in the face or Taking a sex toy where the sun don't shine. I don't know. Like there's <laughs> there's just so many things that time in, in this movie. But the through line about like, you know, when it comes to the like the idea of self-love is the fact that, you know, his alternate personality, like, you know, it it comes to him in a place where, like, you know, because he's letting like people just take advantage of him and not take him seriously. And he finally learns to stand up for himself through developing a split personality. And he ends up standing up to that split personality so it's like yeah you know like you know there's so many of us that are so passive aggressive about life and say want to say the things that we need to say kind of like a liar liar you know want to speak our truth whatever but we just let so many things slide when we really shouldn't and we reach our breaking point and you know that breaking point might end up like us turning to someone that who like we don't even recognize and you know, and that kind of happens to him, except it does in a way where it's actually ultimately helpful towards him. You know, I think even at one point, you know, um, like, you know, Charlie, you know, Jim Carrey's character, his alternate personality, Hank, like Hank is someone who ultimately pushes him to just, you know, like, be more confident, be more brave, kind of like what Loki does for, you know, Jim Carrey's character as Stanley in um, The Mask. Except there's no interaction there, but it's still kind of like the same idea of like, you know, stop letting life beat you up. Stop letting life walk all over you. You know, this put your hands on the wheel and take control. <laughs> and, and yeah, it's just like it's done in the most ridiculous over the top way. But like I said, the, like the through line is like, you know, you got to end up you got to stand up for yourself at the end of the day. Because if you don't do it, no one else will. It shouldn't take as far as you developing a whole new personality, becoming schizophrenic in order to, you know, finally, like, you know, get that boost of confidence, get that backbone. Like, it shouldn't have to happen like that, you know. You should be your own Hank. And you, know? you, you can't tell me that M. Night Shyamalan didn't base Split <laughs> on me, myself, and Irene. You cannot tell me that, bro. I don't care what nobody says. He just took and it slid the the balance of comedy and darkness closer uh, to darkness and kept the comedic aspect to it. 
I don't I I don't see how how there's no influence there. Um, but I will say <laughs> that the most memorable thing about that film, because I haven't seen that movie in years, but the most memorable okay. thing is him kicking his own ass. <laughs> like that yeah. that to me is the one thing that you said where I'm like, I can see it right now. Like, um, so if there's anything Which he also does in Liar Liar. I think he does the same something similar in um fun with Dick and Jane. If I'm okay. let me let me know in the comments if I'm wrong. I've only seen that movie once. Uh, but let me know if I'm wrong about that. Is there a scene in, in Fun with Dick and Jane where Jim Carrey kicks his own ass? That's but not yes. a quotable line from Liar Liar. I'm kicking my ass. Like it's a quotable movie, bro. <laughs> yeah, they don't make up like this anymore. I know that's a cliche thing to say, but you know, the movie's 24 years old at this point. Yeah, I just I miss like an abashed 2000s humor like this. It's a completely different time in comedy. Mm-hmm. And that's thank God for film to preserve history. I feel like we could definitely learn more from from movies than we do in real life. Sometimes we catch ourselves stating something as fact or stating something as a, as an experience that you never even really experienced. You just saw it in a movie. And to you, then it becomes fact. And I th- I'm sure there has to be some type of name for that and because it's definitely some type of phenomenon. I catch myself doing that shit a lot. Or I'll state something as something I know to be true. Like, this happened to me. And it's like, no, motherfucker, you just seen that in movies a bunch of times. Now it's a fact in your mind. If you do know the name of that, drop, if there's anything, drop that in the comments. Because I, I reference that all the time and I don't know what the name of that would be. But it's just that phenomenon of knowing something that you've never, that never really happened to you. Um, but me, myself, and Irene, I think that's, a, I wouldn't consider it a classic, but it's definitely a cult classic. Mm-hmm. It's either either you're obsessed with this movie and the comedy in it and the laughs that you have, or you just you don't you just hate. Because some people, nah, fuck some people. Uh, let's move on. Is it, you got anything else to say? Man, there's so many things I can say about this. This is one of my all-time favorite comedies. But uh, yeah, I just like said, <laughs> there's so many reasons why this movie could be canceled now. I, um, I can't wait. To, I can't wait to hear your all-time favorite comedies list because now we already have. Me, myself, and Irene in Wolf of Wall Street, which are completely different movies. So I'm like, um, I was it Wolf of Wall Did you name Wolf of Wall Because I remember it was a movie. Yeah, it is, it's up there. Yeah, Wolf, Wolf of Wall, Wall Street's up there. Yeah, I'm very curious to hear this list. Yeah, um, just what happened with the cow, what happens with the albino guy. Um, the... <laughs> There's just so many things that I was just like, man, this movie would be so canceled now. <laughs> but... If anything, that's what makes it more special to me now, like watching it now and knowing that it got away with the things it got away with back then, because I feel like that's what comedy's supposed to do. I don't think there should be limitations and restraints on comedy. If it's not funny to you, I don't think it's, you should be wanting to cancel it. You should just change the channel or it. change, don't subscribe to it, whatever the case may be. Like, you know, you have the choice not to watch it, to click out of it. My number three is a Netflix original documentary. It is Jim and Andy, The Great Beyond, featuring a very special contractually obligated mention of Tony Clifton. And this film came out in 2017. It is the only, and last time I'll be saying the full title, um, but Jim and Andy is the the behind-the-scenes footage that was filmed during the making of my number two, which is Man on the Moon, and ultimately it turned into a documentary. They had so much behind-the-scenes footage, and the reason why this is on my list is because it's, it's it's a necessary component to understand why Man on the Moon was such a great, why it's one of the greatest performances of all time why it's just one of the greatest examples of method acting. And also, it's also like one of the greatest documentaries of all time. Um, and it, it adds to the surrealism of Man on the Moon. In general, watching this movie and watching Jim Carrey become or be Andy Kaufman, to me, it is like watching God create me. 
Like that is the epitome of watching this Jim and Andy documentary. The most difficult thing is to understand where is the line? Where is the line of separation? Where is the line that separates Jim and Andy? Where is the line that separates the film from the documentary? Where is the line that separates you from your television? It's almost impossible to, to, to see all these different nuances. It all just becomes one big reality, but none of it's real. And that's the thing, like they're making a movie that's not real, but it all seems real. And it all starts with Jim Carrey allowing Andy Kaufman, his spirit to take over his portrayal of Andy Kaufman in the film. And it's so real that the man who plays Jim Carrey's father in this, in this behind the scenes footage is arguing with Andy Kaufman um, in the trailer as Andy Kaufman's father. It's not like they're practicing or nothing like that. They genuinely got into an argument. And after the father storms out, the makeup artist who's doing Jim Carrey's makeup is bawling tears because she felt like she just watched a man and his father argue. And it's it's just, it's that realistic to where she got so wrapped up in it that she didn't know whether it was real or not. Yeah. And, and Jim Carrey became Andy Kaufman so much so that Andy Kaufman's brother and his wife would talk to him as if he was Andy Kaufman and was there was no acting. They were actually having conversations about things that actually happened. And that type of stuff made you question, did Andy Kaufman come back and take over Jim Carrey's body? There's no way that you could prove he did not because of all these things that you see in this film. Nobody can act this, this well. And obviously they didn't know it was going to be a movie, so there would be no reason for them to be acting. And you see Milos Foreman um, complain about um, Tony Clifton and how difficult it was to direct them. And you see Danny DeVito get chills and get weirded out. And const There's constantly people saying, this is so weird. This is so weird. As an artist, this is, the, this is a productive obsession. This is an obsession that you get so immersed in the art that you don't know where you begin and where and where you end. In the making of the art, this is healthy. You know, we always see with method acting that after a while it takes a, a, a wear, it has a wear and tear on the actual artist. We've seen it with um, Michael B. Jordan with Killmonger and how he said that he had to go seek therapy and Jamie Foxx with Ray and even, uh, I believe, the soloist. Like, those Shia things kind of kind of lingered on. Shia LaBeouf, definitely. I think that's probably the the toughest one in terms of how it affected a person's career. But then mm -hmm. even Jim Carrey has stated that in The Grinch, he still had Andy Kaufman kind of bleed over into mm -hmm. The Grinch. Um, but this is just, I feel like I'm rambling, but this is just such a great, this is one of the greatest biographies of all time um, or bi um, documentaries of all time. This is one of the greatest documentaries of all time. And you just get to see, again, the making of a man, the creation of a man. And go watch how to become immersed in a film, in a character, in a world. And learn how to just be obsessed with art, with film. Yeah. Hey, maybe for this movie, like, he maybe... He was possessed by Loki, or maybe, you know, so I made a birthday wish. Maybe oh, it's a slip oh, personality. Who knows? Oh, all right. <laughs> no, I just like I said, I want to watch Man on the Moon. I want to watch this documentary. Um, you know, the fact that, you know, brought that woman to tears where she thought a man and her his father were actually talking to each other. That's, that's what else, what else selling, what other selling point do you really need after that? <laughs> when you see Jim Carrey, <laughs> It's just, it's, it's, although it's not Jim Carrey acting necessarily in this documentary, it is his great, greatest performance in anything on film. Like I said, it was Man on the Moon, but it's just like to see him in action and like how he committed his entire life to yeah. the character of Andy Kaufman, it's like, it's kind of hard to say which one's better. Was it the performance or was it the preparation? And that's the question that you have to ask yourself. And I, I would like to put up a poll 
that ask you, the viewing public, what is more important, the creation or the creator? What's made or the product or how it's made? It's like, it's tough to say, but I'm a documentary. We can turn that into a religious debate. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the fact that I said it's like watching God create man is <laughs> already a religious debate. So you are right. a thousand percent right. Um, but what is God but a creator? Yeah. The making of Man on the Moon, which is Jim and Andy, the great beyond, featuring. I'm not going to try to do this. But yeah, Jim and Andy, this film, again, this film came out in 2017. I don't know if I said that the first time. This film came out in 2017. Again, it is a Netflix original. Go ahead and check it out on Netflix. Jim and Andy, The Great Beyond. Arguably one of the greatest films of all time. Definitely a, one of the greatest documentaries of all time. I don't want to skip the fact that this film, Jim and Andy, The Great Beyond, was directed by Chris Smith. Um, who's also known for directing a lot of other documentaries, uh, probably keeping it in line with the Netflix family. Um, he did direct Senior, um, which features a conversation between Ronnie, Robert Downey Jr. and his father, Robert Downey Sr., and the just the life and career of technically both, uh, which is also, again, again, it's on Netflix. It's a great documentary also. But just for the sake of what we're talking about here, Jim and Andy, The Great Beyond, directed by Chris Smith. For me, like, you've heard my my personal three, you've heard Space's personal three, but collectively we did choose one movie we could both agree on in terms of, um, like, we just couldn't split this one. We couldn't split custody on this one. <laughs> or, or we did split custody on this one. You know, just like... Uh, we we both chose Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. You know, like where I feel like our own like separate movies that we chose our own separate three choices could be more of a focus on primarily like self love. There's a there's an element of like you know loving others in those movies, but at the same time, it's like it's ultimately about like self love and self acceptance. This uh, Eternal Sunshine is for sure about like process of loving someone else and learning to love someone else unconditionally and this one i'm not going to go into detail to like you know i kind of gave you the run, run through of those other movies on my list and he did the same with his but for me like i definitely want you to go into this movie blind completely blind even though it's still like relatively old you know it's been out for like roughly actually this year is its 20th anniversary so you know expect a celebration this movie came out 2004 yeah the way, like, you know, like, I want to, like, if you haven't seen it, definitely go watch it because, like, it's a depiction of love for another person. Um, it's It can be extremely difficult to watch at times, but it also is extremely beautiful. And, um, yeah, like, you know, look forward to our breakdown, our breakdown of that film, as well as these other ones, too. Like, you know, we definitely want to break these other ones down in separate videos. But yeah, like, you know, this all leading up to Eternal Sunshine to celebrate its 20th anniversary. By the way, the 30th anniversary of the Mass. I just thought about that. But yeah, so the 20th anniversary of Eternal Sunshine. Uh, look forward to that video. I, I would definitely say, I mean, I don't want, I mean, I, I'm just, just as much as you, I would want somebody to go into it blind and not give away, you know, the essence of how it's going to make you feel. But as a person who this film actually like helped obviously all of my all the films on my list had a surrealistic quality to it but i think this one has a traditional surrealism to it um the rest of them just kind of made you feel that way based on how the story went but this one has the actual fantasy quality to it that is attached to surrealism so Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, a movie that you go watch on a loop, a movie that I did college classes for several times to just sit and watch. It's a movie you'll never forget. If you've ever been in love, yeah. it's a movie that will forever be in your mind. 
Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, starring Jim Carrey. Well, it's Kate yeah. Winslet, and one of my favorite roles from her. I haven't seen too many of her movies, but this lady, out of the ones I've seen, like she's like she's great in this one. Yeah. Also, Mark Ruffalo before he was the Hulk. Mark Ruffalo. Kirsten and Dunst after Spider Man. Kirsten Dunst, not to be confused with Cameron Diaz in the mask. <laughs> definitely not. To, I mean, if you're asking me, definitely not to be confused with Cameron Diaz. But I feel like this is like one of those movies that I could actually stomach her in. That's what I will pitch this as. This is a Kirsten Dunst movie where she's not annoying. Every other movie, she's kind of annoying. And even Spider Man. She's whiny in Spider Man. I hate her in Spider Man. Okay. But Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, probably the one and only film that Kirsten Dunst is bearable. <laughs> That's the pitch. But we're missing one person. What's his name? Elijah Wood. Elijah Wood. Yeah, there Post Lord of the Rings, Elijah Wood. Yes. Elijah Wood. It's crazy to see where his career went because, like, he just kind of, like, you would think after doing all the movies on that level that he would just become this megastar. But at this point, like, he could just probably walk down the street and not be recognized low key. Nah, that's Cat, bro. He's a child actor. Yeah, all right. <laughs> but I, I will ask this question who, who has the most success? After starring in a franchise, is it him or Harry Potter? Who had more success? I would say Elijah Wood. I don't know. Like, because the only movie I could think of that Daniel Radcliffe uh, really got like acclaim and recognition for is a movie where he's playing a dead guy, a farting corpse. That Swiss Army Man, which I haven't seen, but like he's a dead guy in that movie. So I don't know how far you, you can say that goes in terms of his career. It was like, you know. I think um, it's pretty poetic. <laughs> you said it, not me. Um, I don't know. Like, he's not really... I don't feel like either one of them are super known for a lot. Besides just, like, random, like... Nah, like, Elijah Wood. Elijah had Wood, he show. was in... Elijah Wood, yeah, that's true. And he was in Sin City. For those of you who remember Sin City, that role he had in Sin City, I, he was a cool character in Sin City. Um, demented, but cool. Um... Let us know in the comments. That we'll yeah. leave it there. Let us know in the comments who has a better career, Elijah Wood or Daniel Harry Potter Radcliffe. But uh, Mark Ruffalo, he blows them both blow of them out of the water. <laughs> <laughs> Considering what I'm hearing about this Four Things movie, he's already like moving on to uh, moving on from Marvel to MCU in a tremendous way. No disrespect, but I I saw that movie more as um, Emma Stone's movie. Emma Stone's movie. Well, I, I heard I, he's really great in it. I'm going to suspend judgment because I have I still haven't seen it yet. Gerard Carmichael, shout out to Gerard Mar Carmichael, since we're talking about that movie. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, back to Jim Carrey. That was a, a long digression. Yeah, it was. <laughs> um, this has been another episode of Insomnia from Lunch where we talk about the great and iconic, the genius, the man of many faces, Jim Carrey, arguably the greatest actor of all time, um, guaranteed to be the only person in that argument who could also be considered underrated. Let us know in the comments, what's your favorite Jim Carrey movie? Yeah. I honestly think... Yeah, a lot of people are going to say a movie off my list. Um, goofy people might say things off of your list. I'm surprised with your list that you didn't say Dumb and Dumb. I could have. I did it. Yeah. It's um, your list. Honestly, I feel like most people are going to say Eternal Sunshine. I think that's his greatest film. Yeah, but I, I just feel like that's well, his for anybody and everybody who have seen it. It's most relatable. Yeah. Most definitely is most relatable. But I don't know. I feel like people like things that they can continue to rewatch. I don't think a lot of people can stomach something that heavy. Yeah, maybe over you're right. Over and over again. And that's, again, that's what's wrong with me is that I did do it. <laughs> or let me not say that. That's what's right with me. The fact that I am mentally strong enough to sit there and rewatch that movie.
which is why you you at home, if you have not seen Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, definitely watch it now because we will be talking about that in the coming weeks. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, one of Jim Carrey's greatest and most relatable films to to this to this day. Like I said, it's a 20th anniversary, baby. Let's go. <laughs> Again, this has been another episode of Insomnia for Lunch. Thank you, thank you, thank you for making it this far. If you have not already commented on something, again, let us know what is your favorite Jim Carrey movie. And if you've never seen a Jim Carrey movie, let me know. Because that would, again, drive home the point of him being underrated. But this has been seven movies, seven Jim Carrey movies to live from. Seven Jim Carreys to guide you through a productive, healthy, and just movie-loving life. Yeah, honestly, like, I'm just grateful that, you know, you have an actor like this. Jim Carrey is just one of those actors that I'm genuinely grateful for, just his mind and the content that he's made over the years. And... Um, the fact that he's been so unabashedly him, you know, something that, like I told Space God off camera, is that he's really made a career out of doing something that probably when he was a kid, he got bullied for, for being like weird and awkward and goofy and stuff like that. You know, he's probably teased for it, but yeah, he's turned it into something that's made him millions of dollars and made him like, you know, famous and um, just an icon. And it just goes to show you like whatever it is that you feel like you're ashamed of or you feel like maybe a weakness or you feel like people just give you a bunch of heart, uh, give you a hard time for, it's probably your greatest asset. You know, not even probably, it is. And you need to use that to your advantage and you need to take full control of it. And it's your meal ticket. Honestly, it's your meal ticket. You know, Jim Carrey is one of the best examples, if not the best example of that. You know, your weirdo be a weirdo and go, go all the way in with it. As long as you end up doing anything illegal, <laughs> let it be legal. That's all I'm that. saying. Like, just let it be legal. And yeah, just like embrace your weirdness. Awkwardness, your strangeness, all that. Embrace it. Again, salute to Jim Carrey and a salute to you. This has been another episode of Insomnia for Lunch. I am Space God. This genius over here is Anubis, and we'll be right back after these messages. <laughs>